like to welcome you all to the gallery tonight. I'm very excited and honored to have this show. And I need to thank a few people that are here and some people that are not. Um, um, well, first of all, I'd say people always say, this week, as people have been looking at the show, they're like, how did you get this show? And I really have to thank Bill Rhodes, who is a friend, uh, who's not here tonight. He lives in Madras, and he was a good friend of Manuel's and has really helped the family with um, the collection and exhibits and, and et cetera. And anyway, he's the one that talked to me about doing this show, just in conversations with the gallery. And then um, the um, Laura Rousseau Gallery has been representing his work, I think, since the 80s. Uh, and they were very <laughs> encouraging of us to do an exhibit as well. So it's, it's really nice when galleries can work in cooperation like that. So anyway, I've known of him and his work over the years, and it's really exciting to have it in my gallery <laughs> and to have the sculpture and the prints and the pastels. Um, I want to thank Sarah Esquerdo, here, who is here tonight, Manuel's daughter. Yay, Sarah, thank you for having us over so many times and just being so nice and easy to work with and just generous. Um, and this has just been really a, a real pleasure. And her brother Pablo also has been, uh, he's not here tonight, but he's been just really great as well. Um, Aron Schlesinger, my sweetheart, helped me drive up to Portland in my dad's big old Chevy van and meticulously wrapped each piece and packed it with amazing efficiency. <laughs> so thank you for everything. Um, and um, finally, I'm so happy that Bonnie Hull, who's an artist in, in Salem, and Roger Hull, who is, I want to make sure I get the title right, he um, are, is a senior faculty curator for the Halley Ford Museum of Art and Professor em Emeritus at Willamette University. And I, I know many of you who've been in the gallery have probably seen these various catalogs that really help me uh, explain and learn about these wonderful Oregon artists. And he's done numerous um, monographs that have really helped preserve uh, the wonderful legacy of these artists. And many of them we've gotten to show in our gallery, Jan Zock, um, Carl Hall, George Johansson, and he's working on a, a, an exhibit, and you, you've already written, and it's probably in press for Nelson Sanger, and are we? Right. Yeah, so that's going to be out soon, and there will be an exhibit in May and June up at the Halley Ford Museum of Art. So anyway, I'm rambling on way too much. Um, Roger Hull's here to say a few words and maybe even answer some questions at the end. Sure. Anybody Bye. has them? Anyway, thank you, Roger. Well, thank you very much, Karen, for inviting me to uh, say a few words. I think I can get them uh, uttered in under 45 minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Oh, or 50. Uh, I uh, came to know quite a bit about Manuel Esquerro and his work in the course of uh, organizing an exhibition, a retrospective exhibition, up at the Halley Ford Museum in 2013. Uh, and uh, on the occasion of that, wrote a, a monograph, which is here to, for you to look at if you'd like. Uh, and that involved many, many chats with Sarah Izquierdo and uh, friends of Manuel's uh, who knew him uh, throughout his life. So in the course of things, I got to know the man quite well. I'd actually met him on occasion, though I didn't know him well. Uh, but by the time I got through writing about him, I felt like I knew virtually everything, but I'm sure I didn't quite know everything. Uh, <clears throat> the story of Manuel Izquierdo is a very uh, compelling and rather poignant one. Uh, his background, his early childhood background, was very fraught. He was born in uh, Spain, in Madrid, in 1925, uh, <clears throat> in a uh, working class artisanal family, quite poverty stricken family. His father, a brick uh, mason, his grandfather, a cabinet maker of some skill, considerable skill. And one of Manuel's early uh, memories as a child in Madrid was uh, uh, visiting his grandfather's studio, which was right next door to the, his own family house, uh, spending hours in there watching his grandfather work with tools, beginning to handle tools himself, beginning to, uh, his grandfather would let him whittle and carve uh, little bits of wood. And he later credited that experience with being hugely important in his uh, odyssey of becoming an artist and a sculptor. 
uh, later in life. Uh, so he lived there with his parents and his younger brother and sister uh, and the grandparents right next door, so in a little uh, enclave in the north edge of Madrid. In 1936, when uh, Manuel was about 10 or 11, the Spanish Civil War erupted, causing all manner of chaos throughout the country and for the Izquierdo family in particular. Uh, the father was on the wrong side of the um, battle uh, of the Spanish Civil War and ended up in prison for an extended period. Uh, the mother and the children went to Barcelona where the kids were placed in a kind of refuge home for children, uh, trying to keep this, these children safe uh, during the uh, chaos of the, uh, of the war. Uh, in 1939, it was decided that the sort of orphanage of children should, that they should be relocated to France. So they were all loaded onto buses and taken over the Pyrenees into France. Mm -hmm. A harrowing <laughs> adventure, which I won't go into, but it was very fraught for Manuel and his, and his brother and sister. And then they spent a couple of years in France, first near Nice and then near Marseille, again in special housing arrangements that were made for displaced children. And the, where they spent the mo most time was in Marseille, about an hour's bus ride outside of Marseille, in an institution run by first Mennonites and then Quakers. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a pretty settled, uh, humane situation. But by 41, the Nazis were encroaching upon the Marseille area, and the Quaker officials decided that they needed to uh, have these children immigrate, immigrate to the States, to the United States, especially Spanish children and Jewish children. So uh, in 1942, they were put aboard this ship, sailed to New York. Uh, again, we're in a sort of a holding pattern there for a time, while uh, officials tried to find um, um, foster homes for all these children. Manuel insisted that he and his siblings not be separated, <coughs> but we got together, <coughs> although many siblings did get dispersed to different homes. Uh, but Manuel was adamant, so it took a while, oh, thank you, it took a while <coughs> to um, get them placed. And finally, the Macaulays, Mr. and Mrs. Macaulay of Southeast Portland, agreed to take all three. So uh, in the summer of 43, the spring of 43, they got on the train in New York, came across the country. <coughs> Uh, piped into Union Station in May, <clears throat> and there were the Macaulays. Uh, Mrs. Macaulay was of Mexican descent and uh, uh, was very a Spanish speaker, and very interested in language and Spanish. And, uh, I think that was part of what greased the wheels of the children coming to that particular uh, home. Uh, <clears throat> immediately, Manuel was swept up into the art world of Portland. It's kind of an amazing segue into the Portland art scene. So we're in 1943. He's just arrived. He doesn't speak English. They speak French and Spanish, of course, but not English. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but he already has shown signs of, being, of having artistic talent. In fact, when he was in Marseille, he would take the bus downtown in Marseille and take classes at the School of the Beaux-Arts. So he had a kind of a pre-reputation almost, even though he was just 15 years old or so. Uh, so a counselor thought it would be great to help him get acclimated if he worked with an artist in Portland, and she signed him up with Hilda Morris. Oh. <laughs> Hilda Morris. Uh, and so every Saturday morning, he would go over to Hilda Morris's, and Carl Morris's house, uh, and have an art class with her. Uh, just all by himself. It wasn't sculpture so much, it was painting, drawing, uh, general art class. But nonetheless, here was you know, an immediate, an immediate introduction to art, to an artist uh, in this new strange place in Portland. In the fall of 43, he enrolled in uh, Washington High School, he was living in southeast Portland. Uh, and lo and behold, one of the friends he met, met there was um, John, um, I don't remember the name. Uh, Reynolds, John Reynolds, the son of uh, uh, Lloyd Reynolds, the calligrapher and the uh, woodcut artist, the printmaker who taught at Reed College. Uh, Lloyd Reynolds himself was, a, was from a somewhat poverty stricken background. He sort of bonded with the young uh, and talented, seemingly talented Manuel. And it was Lloyd who taught Manuel to do woodblock prints. 
which became an important aspect of the Wells production, as you can see from this picture, in this exhibition. So, you know, immediately we're in touch with Hilda Morris, we're in touch with uh, Lloyd Reynolds, uh, and it was at the Lloyd Reynolds house on a Christmas, maybe the first Christmas, I'm not sure which Christmas, that he met Frederick Lippmann, Frederick Lippmann, the famous uh, Oregon sculptor, uh, who was to become Manuel's sculptural, men, sculptural mentor through the, uh, through the uh, all through the 1940s. Frederick Lippmann, himself an immigrant, he and his wife, the sculptor Marianne Gold, had immigrated from Europe in 1940, come to Portland in 1941, now it's 1943, 1944. Lippmann is teaching at the museum school, now the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Uh, and uh, when Manuel graduated from high school, he immediately enrolled in the museum school, he studied with Lippmann. He was Lippmann's apprentice in Lippmann's own studio off away from the school. Uh, and so the 40s were pretty much Lippmann encouraging, promoting, uh, and influencing uh, the young Manuel. When Manuel completed his uh, certificate work at this school, he became an instructor there and taught there for the next, I don't know what, 30, 48, I think it was, next 48 years, uh, all the while arising to prominence as a, as a sculptor. So uh, quite the story, quite the story of sort of being shepherded, to use a word I'm going to bring up again in a minute, shepherd. Uh, shepherded into this uh, world of art, uh, and kind of the key world of art, or the, 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 the school that's centered around the museum school and all the faculty members. Uh, so, a uh, little background on Manuel, more than you wanted to have to know, perhaps. <laughs> but there, there's that. Now, a little bit about his uh, thematic uh, interests. Uh, as a sculptor, a young sculptor, he was particularly taken with the themes of warrior and shepherd. And this exhibition has quite a few examples, small scale examples, of uh, sculptures that are either warriors or uh, shepherds. This is a warrior. Uh, there is a beautiful shepherd over there, several shepherds and a warrior. Uh, he would do these early works primarily in terracotta or sometimes plaster sometimes wood. It was later that he became uh, involved with metal that becomes the medium he's most known for uh, in the long run. Uh, but these early pieces tended to be in these more affordable media of plaster or uh, terracotta or wood. He would often patina them to look like cast bronze, uh, but they, they aren't bronze, but they, you know, they uh, have the idea that they could be. <laughs> and might sometimes it's turned, it's someday turn into bronze. So. <laughs> Uh, and I, the shepherd and uh, warrior uh, subjects were somewhat autobiographical because he was really quite a fierce young guy who, uh, you know, through all sorts of turmoil, <coughs> led these kids, his his, not his children, but they were almost like his children, his brother and his sister, through very difficult circumstances, uh, acting the role, in a sense, of a warrior, fighting the way uh, forward, but at the same time, shepherd, the sort of protecting, nurturing, caring um, figure. So I think there was a lot of um, interplay with his own imagined past, experienced and remembered and reimagined past in the Shepherd and Warrior works. Uh, he was also interested in mythology. So a number of his works involve uh, goddesses and mythological characters. Uh, one that he explored a number of times was Icarus. The boy flew too near the uh, sun and his wings that he had made, his father had made for him, melted and he fell to the sea and so forth. A lot of uh, metaphorical implications to that story that again probably resonate with Manuel. Uh, and uh, did some very uh, important works that are based on Icarus. He loved women and uh, Venus makes her way into uh, his work uh, in, in small works like these and in bigger works as well. Uh, often uh, simply profiles of women's heads with the hair flowing, uh, another uh, subject that we love to uh, explore. Uh, in the early 50s, David Smith came to Portland, and uh, David Smith, you know, is the noted uh, American sculptor of the mid-century, known for welded metal. And uh, it was that, and Manuel met uh, David Smith, and uh, they got on uh, quite uh, effectively. And from then on, Manuel did a lot of exploration of welding metal, first pieces of junk metal, 
uh, he had told of people bringing him junk metal until his yard was so full of it that he could hardly get out of the house. Uh, and some of his early pieces survive that are made of various pieces uh, found and welded together. Uh, what he ultimately became known for in metal work was, uh, was welded um, sheet metal, welded sheet steel and welded sheet bronze. Uh, and became a very uh, skilled welder, so skilled that he was able to totally, uh, early on not so much, but later, totally uh, rid his work of the beads, the, the visual appearance of the beaded metal that marks the seam of a weld. They were beaded, but on the inner side. So that on the outside, you have this very smooth, uh, undulating transition from uh, one plane to another, no bumpy road to get over, no bumpy little hump, but smooth, curvaceous. Uh, and that is ultimately what his late work is all about, sort of the curving, voluptuous, often feminine inflected uh, form. Uh, the Dreamer in Petty Grove Park in Portland is a huge example of, uh, and major example of that kind of figure, the odalisk, the lounging goddess. Uh, he loved Goya and uh, the, you know, the Maha nude and the Maha clothed, more nude than clothed for uh, Manuel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, there's that whole sort of voluptuous thing. Uh, he would work in his uh, studios by uh, day doing sculpture. His compound, that was his studios and his house are still intact in southeast Portland near Lewis and Clark College, and that's where Karen went and got these uh, pieces uh, from Sarah and Pablo. Uh, <clears throat> so he'd work in these, there were two structures there that were for sculpture making. He'd work on sculpture by day. After dinner, he'd go upstairs in the house to a room he had set up for print, for carving blocks for prints. Uh, so that was uh, sort of a nocturnal activity for him. It was a very important, though secondary, strain in his work, going all the way back to Lloyd, Lloyd Reynolds. Uh, and the prints, you can see, are, in, in, some, in many cases, a bit more, um, oh, as I look at these two, this little thesis doesn't know about, but in general, but many of them are rather figurative, uh, showing uh, uh, recognizable forms, uh, rather illustrational in a sense, often quite witty, quite comedic, uh, a little more accessible, maybe, uh, a little more fun, maybe, than the sculptures. Uh, sort of a different vein, a different side of his personality being expressed by them, you might, you might say. And yet there's an awfully nice series of similarities between what goes on in the prints and what goes on in the sculptures. And I think you need only look at this pair right here, for example, to see his love of the curving line, the bulging, the, the folding, fulsome form, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, rhythmic uh, pattern of repeated lines. Uh, he, there's a certain vocabulary that carries through all his work, despite the different uh, range. So that was supposed to be a five-minute commentary. <laughs> there you go. And uh, I have work uh, I appreciate your attention. And if you have any questions, I could try to answer them. Although, who knows? These are his pastel paintings as well. Yes, he early on, when he was at the museum school, studied painting as well as sculpture. Uh, they didn't have woodblock painting at that point in the school. Uh, and gradually he didn't do much painting anymore, but, but he did continue well, well into his later years doing these large, very free uh, pastels there. Yes, the obvious question, was he acquainted with Jan Zah? During yes, they knew each other. Uh, there's a certain uh, correspondence between them and uh, Jan Zach would look up Manuel in Portland and uh, vice versa. Uh, I don't know that they were uh, terribly close, so they had a certain amount in common, both being immigrants and um, both being that sort of mid-century metal uh, American sculpture school. Um, aside from the Port Portland artists that you mentioned, does he have, did he have other artists that basically followed or inspired? He was extremely interested in international, European, international modern art. Uh, Picasso, but especially that other, that sculptor who worked with Picasso, Gonzalez, was that his name? Very much Spanish, very much interested in his work. 
Uh, he was very interested in Henry Moore and went to visit Henry Moore. Uh, he, I think he really thought of himself as one of them, like them. And I think it was a matter of some regret that his reputation didn't really ultimately, it was a very important reputation in the Northwest by that, and perhaps in California, but I don't think it, he had the time or the effort or the wherewithal to get it further out there than that. But he saw himself as part of the story of modern sculpture internationally and admired the work of very important for sculptors. What happened to his parents? One day, uh, it, so uh, the mother took them to Barcelona, and uh, Manuela, her name was, and uh, they, uh, they were in this kind of home. She would visit periodically, visit them. And one day, she didn't visit them. And, she never visited again, and they then had to go off to France. And they never heard of her again. I don't know whether she was killed in the crossfire or she was ill and died. The father, uh, Ventura, uh, eventually joined Manuel and his siblings in Portland and lived, in, lived out his life in Portland. He worked at the Portland Art Museum as a custodian. He never spoke. English, so I, but he was there too. So, so yeah. another emotional dimension. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the missing mother is a, is a big, a big thing, I think. Do you think it would be about fifty square to have had lived in a central place, New York City area, or the art centers of Europe? Yeah. He would have had more success. Well, I think he would have been more central to the canon of modern sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think he had tremendous success in a sense. He found Portland. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these artists found Portland in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s to be an incredibly supportive mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. The school was there hiring them to teach. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, there was a great camaraderie between the artists. Uh, it was quite a zealous. <laughs> Community art collector. <laughs> the Portland Art Museum had Rachel Griffin, who was you know, promoting Northwest Art. Uh -huh. uh, so there was many there was wonderful support, yeah. but it was within a, a world that is out here among the trees and the islands and the lakes. Yeah. Is the world still that way? I don't think it is quite that way, but it's got a very vital. There, there was a real sort of central core community that. Probably is possible. There's a lot more of this sort of thing, a lot more galleries, it's more dispersed. Let's thank Roger Hall and monographs on Manuel Izquierdo are available here. We have a number of copies. Um, there's some at the front desk and some in my office <laughs> if you're interested. Some of these works, I think, are actually in the, illustrated in the... Yes, actually, yeah, I was happy to discover that. That was excellent. Thank you. And for many of the monographs. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, explain your medium and then talk about the piece you're doing since this is the bird show, right? How did you get involved with that? Uh, I, got in, I got involved, I do a lot of work with a lot of uh, figurative work, studying characters, whether they are people's pets or people, birds, different types of animals. and. Uh, there were some birds in a collection that Karen and Kristen saw, and everything went from there to just develop and start studying them deeper. Uh, and I work mainly so far with graphite. I'm still a student, so I'm still expanding different types, studying different types of mediums. But I find uh, the simplicity of graphite on paper very comforting. It gives me space to bring out different personalities. And yeah. I, yeah. Well, this is, this is a character. I it mean, is, you, yeah. yeah, it's sort so, of, um, it has attitude. I love it. That's a, it's a gorgeous bird. <laughs> it's the second person that said that. Yeah, well, it does. I mean, it's, you know, you, uh, and so what kind of bird is this? This is a Xenos petrel. And so uh, what family is a petrel? It's, huh? What kind, is it a, like a falcon or a hawk or petrel? No, they're not birds of prey. They're seabirds. They're sea birds, from the seagull like family. Call. Yeah. Like but a seagull, but bigger? They're not bigger, they're just a different, it's like a they're different like cousin. Albatross. Yes, yes. So where would I find a bird like this? In the Galap Galapagos, mm -hmm. yeah. They're native of the Galapagos, the Galapagos Islands, yeah. And the owl? Um, and the owls, these are barn owls. Uh, you can see a lot of them at the raptor center if you want to. So you've been there? Out. Yeah, I spent yeah. a lot of time with the birds of prey there to try to get more into the characters and what they're about. And, and they, they, these, the barn owls specifically have always been a passion of mine, so it was an easy character to get into. And yeah, they have a real dynamic to them, don't they? I, uh, a lot of personality. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Gorgeous work. So there's there, there are more mm -hmm. owls here. on the side. Yes. And by the way, if it hasn't been uh, reinforced, you may purchase this work, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, uh, everybody still has charming on this, yeah, but... say that again. They may, you may purchase this work. And particularly if something rings true for you, um, I, I, you know, I bought one of Lynn Peterson's um, crows, because she can do personality with crows, and this is personality in these birds. So um, I'm, I'm so delighted to see it in this show. So. You're so, great work. So, and along those lines, you know, as an artist, I'm also a collector. I've bought, I don't know, ten pieces um, the last few year. Well, over some time, not because I don't have a lot of money, but, and you know, I've never regretted a single cent of that money. In fact, it just like it's one of the best ways I can spend my money. And then people who have collected my work have always said, you know, I'm so happy to have your work. And so, because it really is a thing that lasts in your house and it stays with you and it grows with you, and especially if it's if it's strong work, you may, as you change as a human being, you may see the work differently in 10 years than you do now, or mm -hmm. in 20 years than you do now. Like a poem that touches you, so you read it, and the poem changes as you change. So it is really a beautiful investment, and also a great way to support you know, local artists, Eugene artists. So yeah, I just well, put a plug in for that. Yeah. And, and collect also, art, collect art. Exactly, and and for, as as a buyer, if you are intimidated by by whatever price, um, easy payment plan is conceivable. 
you know, 60 bucks a month, $100, something like that, you can access something you really love. And be thinking about that because um, uh, artists deserves to be compensated and these are deals. And it but, doesn't wear out. No. <laughs> and if you got a lot, like in my place, you can rotate things because if it has to sit on the floor sometimes if you've got a lot of stuff. But redoing is always fun that way. <laughs> nice work. Thank you. Nice work. And so. Well, let's see. Uh, so I have a group here, a group over there, and a group over by the snack table. Um, so I actually don't have a real major reason that I use birds other than the birds are cool and I've always said that I wouldn't want to live in a world that didn't have birds like just to hear them you know it's like part of life affirm affirming experience for me uh, but it's <laughs> there's another one of my students but uh I, I take liberties with the birds a little bit you know but their colors aren't necessarily true the forms aren't necessarily true because what it really does is it gives me an excuse to play with aesthetics in my work. Um, so I take the color of the bird or the pattern of the bird and then I just start playing with, with the idea of pattern and color that are related to the bird or that are actually really different than the bird. You know, so the idea of having some sense of the organic and then some sense of the mathematical or the engineered and then some sense of a sense of sky or land or earth, but also the idea of decoration. You know, so the male birds are very decorated. Um, as a male, I kind of relate to that. You know. <laughs> really, nice shirt. I, you know, like I love the. You know, when I look at well, back in the in the old, you know, medieval period, and the men were peacocks. You know, and they had all the fancy clothes and the cane. And I think I had some part of me live back there once. So I'm living that out in this work, I guess, in some way. And it's working in your shirt too, yeah, right? Right. Got to. Patterns. So the medium. I used to have no interest in patterns at all, but about five years ago, I got really interested in pattern, and I'm getting more and more interested in pattern. And I'm also interested in uh, kind of filling stuff up. And and uh, I think that one of the things I try to do with my work is that, like like I was talking about before, like with a poem or a story like a story, I mean like a myth, a story, a real story, that the more you investigate it, the more you're going to see, the more you're going to get out of it, that it's going to reveal itself over time. And that you might start noticing things you hadn't noticed before. You might want to migrate. So, um, technique? You, you can migrate over to the wine. No, no, no. <laughs> Later, I want to know more about this. So, how do you, um, this is on paper, what kind of papers? Oh, it's just printmaking paper, really. Mm -hmm. And no, so then you mount it on a board, paper. or what do you do then? Uh, it's mounted on archival foam core, wet mounted. Mm -hmm. the, and the frame shop does all that. All right. You know, I just paint them on the wall. Roll it up, and then, and then I, they do it. Well, I try not to roll them, but oh, yeah. Right, and so. then I take them to the frame shop, and they just take care of them. Who does your work? Uh, Vistra. Vistra. They're great. They're mm -hmm. very good to me. Good, and have you observed these birds? What do you paint? Did you do it any of this outside, or is this a... No, again, this is... Um, I'm interested in... Pro so, to me, at the heart of art making is solving a problem. Right? You're going to set up a problem and solve a problem. So, a lot of artists work out a lot of sketches, or they, uh, they kind of have a plan where they're going. When I start a painting, these paintings, I have no idea where I'm going. I pick out a bird, and then I'll start to sketch the bird or roughly paint the bird, which doesn't look anything like that when I start painting it. It might just be blue and yellow. And then I just start building the shapes in relation to that, and I see where I end up. So it's, it's an experiment and it's a discovery. It's not a plan for me. So I have no idea what they're going to look like when I start, other than I know they're going to have hard edges, they're going to have angles, they're going to have pattern, and they're going to have color. That's all I know when I start them. So did you use stencil or did you... Uh, some of that is stencil, stencil huh? yes. Uh. Some of it's drawn, some of it's stencil. And the other thing that... Um, about my work, you know, sometimes artists have a palette, like, like, and, and I really don't want to have a palette, right? So I'll have, I'll have that color, you know, I'll just mm -hmm. pick, oh, I'm going to say I'm going to make a yellow and green painting, I'm going to make a pink and blue painting, I'm going to make a blue painting, I'm going to make a red and yellow painting, 
um, and just try to push the color in a lot of different directions so that I'm not repeat. I don't want to repeat myself. And you're not judgmental about it. I mean, saying one's your favorite and one's not. How's that? Well, usually the one I just finished is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. It's real. Right? <laughs> And actually, probably right now, the two most recent ones are the pink ones on the other side. They're long, skinny. I'm kind of interested in this long, skinny format now, which is kind of weird to play with. And so those are my favorites because those are the two most recent pieces. Yeah. Do the personalities of the birds influence what you do with the rest of the painting? Like crows are Not, a lot different from uh, right. chickadees. Um, well, in all honesty, I actually pick birds that are small. Uh, and that are a little bit humble. I mean, I have did do that one hawk, but um, mostly I pick small birds that are a little bit humble and just bring a song into the world. And so I don't, I don't think I think about personality because for me it really is about just trying to deal with aesthetic problem solving, and then hopefully that ends up looking nice when I'm done. Thank you. He's here. More questions? Yeah, questions. Yeah. Are good. So I also teach, and you know, I always say to my students, if you have something in your head that you're wondering, it uh, probably somebody else is thinking the same thing. And so if you ask a question, you're actually often asking a question that someone else is wondering about. <laughs> yeah, any, any personal favorites from any of you here of these? And these are for sale, too. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and quite affordable, actually. So think about it. Are these yours also? Uh, yeah, there's the ones on this wall by the snack. Yeah. <coughs> so they're all scattered around. Anybody else? <coughs> we have like eight or ten minutes for you um, to enjoy this for sure. Okay, so again, uh, the question I, that I just received was do I go um, watch the birds and sketch them? And I, I don't. I, uh, when I spend time outside, I spend time outside by myself a lot. Um, I just, I just appreciate them. To me, it's almost like two different worlds. Like that world, I'm there and I'm watching birds, and this world, I'm in my studio and I'm playing with color and shape. And, and probably one has to do with the other, but it's not directly related in a weird way. Maybe more of a sort of a soul level way. But, so. The answer is not really. <laughs> okay. Just find a picture I like and start playing. And then, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll just twerk, turn their head or spin them around or angle them or I take liberties. You know. well, I'm not like Audubon. Like I definitely yeah. take. Them. There's another one. Oh. Students. I like seeing these students. We do. <laughs> How about the little details, like what looks like lace in these pictures or <clears throat> sort of Egyptian? Right. Well, again, just playing with the idea of pattern. Um, you know, I see patterns in the world, I see patterns in the birds. But the idea of just how can I incorporate a sort of structured pattern with an unstructured space and sort of harmonize them. So again, it is it is a little bit, I, you know, it is art is like a scientist, where the scientist is dealing with minutia, right? Because the scientist is thinking about, I'm gonna study this fish, and I'm going to study this fish in a way that no one's ever studied this fish and come out with information that no one has ever figured out about this particular fish and it becomes about minutia mm -hmm. in some sense. And so the idea of like I'm playing with color and surface and shape and how do I incorporate these things together and how do I make this work with this and how do I make that work with that. And it, it becomes a, a, to some extent an academic artistic exploration right? rather than a kind of emotional for me. Well, it's kind of cool because as a viewer you get to interpret a lot of what's going right. on. And this is kind of cool. I mean, this whole cosmos thing here with this bird and things is uh, uh, interesting dimensionally. Right. And it just, you know, kind well, of grabs you. I, I like that. And well, so for example, this the, the motivation for this piece was uh, I actually saw a program about Australia and so in the outback, they had, you know, the color of the outback, and there was this river. And there were these pelicans that were using the river to migrate for it. 
And that was the inspiration for these two paintings. Mm -hmm. Just the color and the idea of migration. Even though these birds have nothing to do with <laughs> Australia. <laughs> you know, those are western bluebirds. But, mm -hmm. um, so like, oh, I'll try that. You know, or oh, I'll try that. And then, you know, like I think a, a good storyteller may have a certain idea, but that doesn't mean, you know, if someone else interprets the story differently, well, that's wonderful. Right? Whatever way anybody interprets it is wonderful. Good. There's not one way to see it. There's as many ways to see it as there are people here. That's right. And you're yeah. set free like to bird. do that. Right. Like, like a bird. Yeah. You sing your song now if you'd like. So, um, great insights. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And so, um, Mingo, talk to him. Also, I have the yellow pen.